Hello my friends, it's Manny Rodriguez with Deep True Crime. Thank you for joining me today. If you're new to my channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button. That way YouTube will notify you whenever I either go live or I upload content. My whole focus around this channel is to keep you aware of things that can happen around you. Past cases, current cases, things that you have to be careful for in this crazy life granted we don't want to live in fear but the more you know the more you're aware so if this sounds like something you would like to follow make sure you sub you hit that subscribe button and click this little like underneath here that'll help the channel reach more people in today's episode i want to share with you some facts around ted bundy you may not know Ted Bundy is one of the most prolific serial killers of all time. No one knows exactly how many people he is really killed. So it's hard to really pinpoint the number of people who have died at his hands. But we're going to cover some facts. I'm not going to go through the whole Ted Bundy story. I'm sure by now you have a really good idea of what who he was and the serial killer that he was and he was one of those you know those charming personalities that you believe you can trust and you know that's kind of one of the things that have drawn so many more people to the true crime world are stories like Ted Bundy Right? I could kind of remember when I first heard about him and when I started looking into, wow, how could someone do such a thing? And again, I'm not here to judge, but these actions, you can judge. They were wrong. And I want to share with you some facts you may not know about. So let's go ahead and dive into it, shall we? So the first thing I want to talk about, did you know in the 1970s, in the early 1970s, Ted Bundy worked for a suicide hotline in Seattle, Washington? And according to Anne Rule, who is a well-known author, she worked with him and she remembered him as a skilled volunteer who helped eased trouble callers and even saved lives is that not pretty ironic there and so ann ruler she worked beside him that's where that book comes from the stranger beside me i mean if you really stop and think about it it's like one of the most well-known serial killers ever and you work next to him wow you would have a story you would definitely have a story if you worked next to someone like this i mean like you know the craving he had for this stuff un unbelievable so that's one fact you may not know about and so another thing that i want to share did you know that he confessed to 30 homicides that were committed in seven different states between the years 1974 and 1978. Now, here's where I want to stop here before moving forward. No one really knows the actual answer. It could be more. It may even be less. There's a likelihood it's not quite less, but it very well could be more. And the thing about this is, is he didn't really quite say much until the day before his conviction. And so he went through his victim tally with Bill Hagmeyer of the FBI and he went through it on a state by state basis, which is where he came up with the total 30, 30. I mean, 
No, oh, that's that's just tragic in so many ways. And so he is said to have killed 11 in Washington, eight in Utah, three in Colorado, three in Florida, two in Oregon, two in Idaho, and one in California. Whew. And again, it could be more. You're talking about the day before he was electrocuted, he shared, he shared, he shared, and this was his victim tally. And again, that it could be more. He said himself, it could be a hundred. So you got to take it with a grain of salt. This guy loved attention. He became a very popular, which is very weird, I know, but especially amongst women. They were talking about how attractive he was and the whole nine yards. He became a sensation. Imagine if the internet was as popular back then as it is now. Wow, right? And so it's crazy to even imagine. So another factoid. Now, Ted Bundy, he grew up believing that his mom was actually his sister. That's right. He grew up thinking that this is my sister when really it was his mom. You see, his her the mom's the mom's family, they were all devout Methodists. And so they were, when she, when Louise, his mother, Louise, when she got pregnant, they were completely embarrassed. They were embarrassed. They were ashamed, you know, and the fact that she was pregnant out of wedlock, that was against everything they believed they stood for. Now, they may have come across as devout Methodists into church but they had their own issues in many many ways and so here louise is she gets pregnant out of wedlock and they send her away that's right they send her away and they send her away to a home for unwed mothers and they sent her to vermont where they she, they would be she would be there for until she gave birth in secret. And so a few months later, Louise returned to her family in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia, and you know, her father, Louise's father, Sam Cowell, because see that's where the Ted was born, Ted Cowell. We know him as Ted Bundy but he was born Ted Cowell. And so her father, Sam Cowell, he traveled to the home for unwed mothers to get baby Ted and to bring her back, right? Now, again, she had the baby in secret, no one knew. And so he, he Sam Cowell, and his wife, which would be Louise's mother, they pretended to be the parents. They pretended that they adopted Ted from an orphanage. So his, his days started out very rocky, period. And so Ted, he grew up thinking that his mom was his sister, when actually she was his mom and not his sister, which is crazy, right? Now, eventually, he did find out the truth but no one knows exactly for sure how old he was they don't know if if maybe a relative like a cousin told him or if he later saw it himself and, and saw the birth certificate so that's a little out there that no one really knows for sure you know so but what's also weird now again please take this with a grain of salt Sometimes internet detectives are not always the best, right? Even though I'm playing internet detective, digging deep, checking things out, right? But there have been claims 
But maybe it's because of the way this start out where she went, she had a, she went off to some unwed camp and had a baby and then came back. But there have been claims made by the by Bundy's family, by Ted Bundy's family that Bundy might have been fathered by his mother's abusive father. By his grandfather basically. Saying that, you know, basically that means not only are you my grandfather, but you're my father, which makes you more my father than anything and not my grandfather. But again, no one knows for sure. There was no blood test done or anything like that. Those are only claims. There's really nothing out there to support that it's proven correct or proven wrong. So take that with a grain of salt. But it is true he grew up thinking that his mom was his sister okay so that's just the truth around that particular thing so another factoid for you a lot of his killings a lot of people believe that this was out of anger over his first like his first serious i am in love type girlfriend stephanie brooks that was kind of her, 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 the name she went by. Her real name was Diane Edwards, but she kind of changed it because of her, you know, relationship with Ted Bundy. And so over this breakup, she broke up with him because, you know, he wasn't really showing promise of where they were going. So when they started dating in college of, you know, in 1967, he became romantically involved with Stephanie Brooks, a.k.a. really Diane Edwards. But she ended the relationship due to his lack of ambition to want to do much in his life and his immaturity. So that's kind of his personality. Truth is, right? And so, you know, all of his victims, all of his victims are said to look similar to Stephanie this Brooks right here. Granted, eyes are locked out because she she doesn't want to be seen, right? And you know, they were all they all look similar to her. They were all white females anywhere between the age of her. the youngest that she killed was, that he killed was 12 years old, oldest 25. Right around up through college. Going so young, man, like that that's a sign of his sickness. Not only that you're capable of to do this, but to do this to a little girl, you're a sick, sick dude, man. So, you know, and a lot of them were college students and mostly from middle class backgrounds, just like Stephanie Brooks or Diane Edwards. And it is said that Ted really liked everything about her. Like for his first girlfriend, he's like, you can't do wrong with that. I can't do any wrong. But I, I, that's a great way to start with such a relationship with her, right? So, you know, the, the parents were obviously well. He liked the parents. And, you know, so all of his victims had long, straight, dark brown hair with a part in the middle, just like Stephanie. Now, the 12 year old, I'm not too sure if she looked like Stephanie. I don't, I didn't really stop to look for pictures on that but that it is said to do that and so little by little they were getting closer to ted bundy and so he actually escaped their hands he they had him twice they had him it's crazy crazy so first you know Someone actually breaks away from this guy. Thank the Lord, because who knows how many more people? Well, there were more after he was caught, but we'll get into that. But one person actually escaped his grasp. Carol Duranch. Great job, Carol, that you were freaking not giving up and let, not letting him just do get you. And so Bundy, he... He acted like a police officer to Carol, right? Walks up to Carol at a shopping mall in Utah. And when she was approached by Bundy, he was posing as a police officer. 
And Bundy told her someone had attempted to get into her car and he asked her to come with him to the Murray Police Department. Okay? She's believing it. So she gets in his vehicle, right? Because she says, come with me. We're going to go sign a complaint. And the two drove off in his Volkswagen Beetle. This Volkswagen Beetle would play a big role. And we'll get into that. But he eventually pulled over and he tried to then put handcuffs on her. He actually got one of those handcuffs on. He actually got one of those handcuffs on her. And that's when she started really fighting him. And this is, you know, he got one and then he threatened her with a gun. He threatened her her with a gun she jumps out of the car and flags down a passing vehicle which an elderly couple were driving that and they drove her to a police station where then she was able to give a description of ted bundy and not only that this famous volkswagen beetle that he was in and so then after this is filed right they're, they're now they're looking for him in this volkswagen beetle because it was pretty easy to spot a volkswagen beetle if there's one around and so shortly after a utah highway patrol trooper he was just finishing up his shift and when he saw a volkswagen beetle parked in front of a house that he knew two young women lived there he knew that like why is this there i know these two women live there then we have this guy out there you know who's uh, victimizing women and so the cop pulls up puts his brights on you know the little bright there and he pulls bundy over but bundy takes off he takes off for a little while but he eventually pulls over and you know hayward he starts hayward the police officer he starts he starts asking him questions he's asking him questions about his beetle he's asking him questions you know where he found some handcuffs that were there they so asking him a question because he saw a ski mask there and he's asking about these pantyholes with holes in them making it look like it could be for a mask you guys see where i'm going with that and so the police officer he arrests bundy he arrests him he arrests him for evading an officer he arrests him arrests him for having possessions of a of burglary tools because he has all these tools right and so later bundy is put into a police lineup he's put into a police lineup you know where i'm going with that right and so even though he tried to alter his appearance, it did not work. Durant was able to identify him in the lineup as the man who attacked her. So boom, now he's really arrested and charged with attempted criminal assault and aggravated kidnapping because she points him out without a problem. And so after his trial in 1976, he's found guilty of aggravated kidnapping and sentenced to minimum of one year to a maximum of 15 years in Utah. But while he's there, while he's there, they find evidence that links him to a murder of Karen Campbell. Rest in peace, Karen Campbell. And in search of his car, they found hairs. And one of those matched Karen Campbell. Now, she was a 23-year-old nurse, and she was found murdered near Colorado. Actually, in Colorado, Snowmass, Colorado. And so, a month after she went missing, that's when they, you know, that's when they found her. Hmm. And she was at a ski resort with her fiance. And it, it's well known that Bundy would act like he was injured or something. And, 
and tore them in. He would get them in and say, hey, can you help me with something? One time he had a cast and say, hey, I'm struggling to get this in my car. Can you help me? And they would, they, they're trying to be the good Samaritan, right? Makes sense. And so Bundy, he was charged with first degree murder in the death of Campbell. And so he was transferred from Utah to Aspen, Colorado to face his charges, to stand trial. And so Bundy, weird enough, he was allowed to assist in his own defense. Now, granted, he did try to go to law school. He barely got anywhere with it. But he was known to be an intelligent person, high IQ and everything. And so because he was going to assist in his own defense, he had the right to use the law library there in the jail. And so this was located on the second floor of the same building that he was, that was the, the county courthouse. And so, you know, the judge said, okay, you know, Bundy, you can go ahead and not have any leg shackles on, on, you don't need to have handcuffs on. And so he was allowed to walk freely into the courtroom and to the law library. And so this is exactly his words about this ex escape. This was Ted Bundy's words. He says, over the months, I had noticed a number of opportunities to just walk right out. And so, and he's even heard later saying in a, re in a recording of a phone call with with a prison psychologist, he said, I'd thought a great deal about escape and I don't know if I had the guts to do it, quite frankly. frankly. That's what he said to doctor, you know, a doctor right there in the prison. And so on June 7th of 1977, he finally took the opportunity he finally took it while locked in the law library. So he's in the library basically by himself. And he shares, this is how this has come to light a little on what he was thinking. He says, the guard went outside for a smoke and the windows are open and in his mind and the fresh air is blowing through and the sky was blue and I said, I'm ready to go. And he walked to the window and jumped out this second story window. And he said, and, and when he's talking to the prison psychologist, he says, honest to God, I just got sick and tired of being locked up. Oh, well, do the time. You gotta, you got, you do the crime. You gotta do the time. And so once he jumped, he ran straight for the mountains. He ran straight for the mountains. He tells the doc, I had no plan. I had nobody helping me. I had no money. I had no nothing. That's what he tells the doc. And then he's out, right? And so it took about 10 minutes before anyone realized he escaped prison. 10 minutes. And then so once they did that, they start putting up roadblocks and the sheriff's department is searching all over for, you know, searching each vehicle to make sure that he's not in there, you know, make sure he's not holding someone else up to get his way around. And so he fled into the mountains. And this is where he gets into the mountains. He breaks into a cabin. He stays there for several days. Eventually, he walked back into Aspen, Colorado, where he stole a car that was locked, unlocked. It was unlocked and the keys were in the ignition. And he stole that baby and he was gone, but he didn't get too far. And, you know, before you know it, a deputy pulled over Bundy at the spot in the car weaving along the road. And so it was about six days after he escaped, he's back in custody, right? And so, boom, now they move him to Garfield County Jail in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. And so in his cell was a grate, a grate, you know, with bars. It might have been up uh, up above. And there was like a little grate, kind of like that picture you see there with the bars, but, you know, similar. 
And so there's a little grate that was not secured, given him opportunity. So with this grate, there was a light fixture that was due to be welded, but they hadn't done it yet. And so when Bundy was behind bars, that still needed to be welded. And so while he's in this jail, he's in there for months, he begins to lose weight, noticeable amount of weight. Even his, his uh, former defense attorney even said, when I visited him in, Gr in Glenwood, I noticed he had lost a lot of weight. He said, I'd, I'd say he lost 20 or 25 pounds. I would think this would come to the attention of the jailers, perhaps. Why is he losing all this weight, right? Why is he doing this? And so Bundy, he carves an opening. He carves an opening that was in the ceiling cell that, you know, he carves it wider than it was so that he could fit through it. So that that's why he was losing weight so that he can get through that thing. And so he arranges some law books you know, and, and pillows inside on the bed to make it look like he's sleeping there, to make it look like there's a body still there. And it worked for him. And so he crawls through the duct thing, you know, through the duct, just like in the movie, just like in the movies, he crawls through there. And so Bundy came down through another jailer's apartments who wasn't there and he puts on civilian clothes and escapes and he's gone he is gone and so then then you, as you can see here this fbi wanted poster this was literally the poster that was out there looking for him and so this is where he escapes <laughs> he commits further assaults trying to kill them but he doesn't end up killing them but he does kill three more victims and because when he escapes there when he escapes from there from the police custody for the second time so he leaves the jail he boards a flight to chicago he takes a train to ann arbor michigan he drives south to atlanta he grabs a bus to tallahassee Florida. So he goes from Colorado to Florida, which is where the another big part of what he does when he goes into the sorority house and he he kills two girls and he bludgeons four total to survive to die. Rest in peace, Margaret Bowman. She was only 21 years old. Rest in peace, Lisa Levy. She was only 20 years old. But while he was also on the run, he kills a 12-year-old, Kimberly Leach. Rest in peace, Kimberly Leach. I mean, so, so tragic. So, so tra tragic in so many ways. And so in July of 1979, when they finally get him again, so they, they finally get him. So let me rewind a little to finally capturing him when he's on the run. And so around February 1978, this is more than a month after, you know, he, he was at the Florida State University's Chi Omega house. And a week after abducting Kimberly, the 12 year old from her junior high, Bundy was finally arrested. So about a month after being in Florida, basically. And so in Pensacola, Florida, at about 1.30 in the morning, an officer noticed a car that was, you know, loitering suspiciously. And so the officer, he runs the plates and he realizes that this orange Volkswagen was a stolen vehicle. He notices it's a stolen vehicle. And so, you know, he, he pulls him out. He, he has a little scuffle with Bundy, but eventually Bundy is arrested. But now he's refusing to identify himself, right? Of course, he already knows he's a wanted man. 
And so once he's in custody, once he's in custody, Bundy told officers he was a Florida State University student student that went by the name Kenneth. He says his name is Kenneth from Florida State University, and he gives them a stolen driver's license, right? And so two days after being in custody, he finally reveals his true identity. And so in July of 1979, he's found guilty of first degree murder for killing the two sorority girls, three three counts of attempted murder in the first degree because he attacked Karen Chandler and Cheryl Thomas and Kathleen Kleiner. He was sentenced to death in the electric chair. And so he, as you probably know this much, you know, the following year, in February of 1980, he's convicted of kidnapping and first-degree murder of the 12-year-old Kimberly Leach and again sentenced to death. And on January 24th, 1989, Bundy was strapped into an electric chair at Florida State Prison and at 7.16 a.m., he was pronounced dead. Did you know, and this is kind of what I discussed a little earlier, he had a murder kit. And this was part of what was found in that murder kit. And so he this part of this murder kit was, you know, he had a crowbar that was behind when the cop went so on August of 1975 when Ted Bundy, you know, he fled from patrol Right. Remember, I, I shared that he fled from the police car that pulled him over, th that was attempting to pull him over. And eventually the, the, the police guy caught up to him and they searched his van, his 1968 Volkswagen Beetle. And they found the following suspicious objects. They found a crowbar that was behind the driver's seat. They found a box of large green garbage bags. They found an ice pick, a flashlight, a pair of gloves, torn strips of sheeting, a, a knit ski mask, a pair of hand, a handcuffs, and a strange mask made from pantyhose. Hmm. And they also noticed that that the passenger seat was removed. You can see the, him standing outside and you can see on the right the where the actual seat was removed. It was actually in the back seat. My guess is when he had his victim there, they were lower, harder to see. And so that's when they came across a lot of this. So now, you know, you look at this, this, this Volkswagen Beetle, it's actually in the Alcatraz East Crime Museum. I know, they, th this thing is an, an actual museum. But if you think about everything that this, this I mean, it's kind of creepy, but it makes sense. I'm not a fan of highlighting, you know, big crimes, but obviously me talking about it is kind of highlighting it. My goal is to bring attention. So you are aware of things that could go wrong. And so this, this Volkswagen played a huge role finding the, the evidence needed to help convict them. And so the, the police, they did arrest Bundy for evading an officer, but you know, without finding any concrete evidence tying him to any other crime, when they did get him, they did release him when they first saw all this stuff. But since they couldn't really tie it to anything, they, boom. But here's the thing, little did they know that they were, they just set free one of the worst serial killers in American history. And that's what makes this so, odd and weird and uh that you because if they were able to find anything but you can't if the, all the evidence is not there yet it's not there yet right 
And so Bundy's, you know, what has been documented, you know, his killing spree that has been documented, it began in January of 74 with that violent assault and RAPE of Joni Lentz. She was an 18-year-old freshman and she was attending Bundy's alma mater, the University of Washington. And he continued to kidnap, assault, murder young women through, all throughout Washington, Utah, and Colorado for over a year without being caught until he raised suspicion by fleeing from that patrol car. That, you know, would lead to his first arrest that they would have to let him go. But he would get rearrested about a year and a half later on August of 74. I was almost about to be born. And they arrested him for the possession. Actually, I was born. I was born. So I was about to be a year. But they, he was arrested for the possession of burglary tools based on the items found in his car, which were all those things, right? You know, so a, a further police search found documenting, found, you know, documents connecting Bundy to the location of several missing women. That's why this, this van, this, this Volkswagen really this little bug this beetle plays a big role i mean this thing has become a sensation this beetle has become a big deal people get tattoos with this stupid beetle that freaks me out i mean people i mean i like this true crime stuff to be to play detective but some people are really fascinated with this stuff and this is how he was able to do what he did and because and we'll talk a little more about that but you know they, this would tie him to several missing women in colorado and utah but again nothing substantial enough to hold him and so now with this beetle on the police radar he thoroughly cleaned this volkswagen and sold it to a teenager in sandy utah the following month so around september of 75 and so now on october 2nd three witnesses in utah picked bundy from a police lineup and he was charged with attempted murder and kidnapping and it's interesting because there were other times where he was pinned as that's the guy but they're like no way this clean cut looking dude going to be a lawyer, could do this, and they just disown those witnesses. And so it's interesting because, you know, after these three in Utah picked him out of a police lineup, he's charged with attempted murder and kidnapping, and bail was set at $100,000, right? And so Utah authorities, they seized that, that 1968 Volkswagen and they examined it inch by inch which is starting to help find it this is where they find hairs that match three potential victims and so on march 1st of 76 the utah authorities find him guilty hmm and so that's where i shared with you i'm not going to get into that any more deeper but this this jeep or i'm sorry why do i keep saying jeep this volkswagen beetle plays a huge role in connecting him to murders and ultimately getting him and so, hmm, that's what that's what stinks is that they they he escapes twice. He gets to Florida. If he never escapes, those women never get hurt and die. There'd be a twelve-year-old who can live out her life the way hopefully it was meant to be. But who knows? So th the fact that he would flee to Florida and continue killing for six more weeks. Hmm. Stealing money, stealing credit cards, stealing cars to get by. And then coincidentally driving a stolen Volkswagen Beetle, he's pulled over and boom, then we can finally put him and then he gets the electric chair on January 24th. And so when he's in prison, when he's in pr prison, remember I told you, people, they were enamored by him by his looks, by everything he did, by this notorious serial killer, 
people were fascinated. Here is a picture in the 70s of Carol Ann Boone. He would write to Carol Ann Boone, who lived in a different state. And she lived in a different state, and he would write to her. And she started falling for his stuff. So she moves to Florida. And so while on trial, while on trial, he proposes to Carol Ann Boone. Now, Carol Ann, you can see her, you know, in the 70s, but she has changed her identity four times. But the National Enquirer still caught up with her. I don't know what her new name is, but since this is out there, I will share. And so the National Enquirer got a picture of her. That's what she looks like in more recent times. I wonder, I wonder if she wrote a book. I've not looked into that. That would be interesting to hear her story. But while on trial, he proposes to her. And he's doing this so that the day of, hey, I just got, I just proposed. You guys are not gonna convict me today, right? <laughs> wow, amazing. And so the last fact that I will share, did you know that he helped convict serial killer, different serial killers, but serial killers like Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer. That's right. You see, the FBI wanted to profile different serial killers. And so they came to Ted Bundy to get like, what do you think a serial killer would do? And this, you guys are familiar with the movie Silence of the Lambs? This is a little of where that came from, where he helped profile a serial killer to help them. And one of the big things he talked about was the killer will come back to see their work. That's what Ted Bundy did. He would come back to see his work. And he would, I mean, you're talking about he has decap, 12 different bodies, 12 different ones he is said to have done. And he is, he's also known as a necrophilia where, you know, in, he would have S-E-X with the dead corpse. I mean, this guy had issues that started young. He started getting in trouble young. There are rumors that say he started killing at the young age of 12 but no one can truly prove that and the reason being is because when he was around 15 a 12 year old who was like three miles away went missing she disappeared never to be seen again at 15 years old it would be hard for me to believe he can cover that up for so long and he has denied that to the end but at the same time, while he was in prison, he did deny until the day before when he came up with his list, with his little tally list. He did, he denied, he continued to deny it. And then, boom, they, he, he gave them a whole 30, a bunch of people, a bunch unidentified. Rest in peace to all of his victims that we do and do not know about. Rest in peace. And so here we are, Ted Bundy, one of the most prolific serial killers of all time. And now these are some facts. What is the strangest thing, the strangest thing you know about him? What is the strangest thing that you know about him that maybe a lot of people don't know? Thank you for joining me. I'm Manny Rodriguez. And I notice I got to turn off these comments because I get a bunch of spam. And I'm Manny Rodriguez. Thank you for joining me on Deep True Crime, where we love to cover the things you need to know about because it's a crazy world out there, my friends. Be careful, be safe, and I look forward to serving you again. Peace.